Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, you may have heard the phrase over the last few years of complaint from women of color that often in our coverage, all the African Americans are men and all the women are white, and somehow they're caught in the middle. Well, another aspect of what we saw in this last election year was coverage of women as if all the women that mattered and as if women's issues themselves, in fact, only related to women in the United States. Well, what about the global picture? A year ago in New York, I helped to convene an all-day event that brought women activists from all around the world to discuss exactly that. We've been broadcasting over this week and last week two parts of this special. It's called Bodies of Revolution. Here's part two with Eve Ensler, Monique Wilson, and more. What difference it makes to be seen, to be heard. Going back to 1915 again for a second and the women, International Women's Conference at The Hague that called for a permanent peace and declared a women's charter. They called for an end to sex trafficking. They called for reproductive rights. They called for civil rights in marriage. They called for mothers to be paid. They called for equal rights in trade unions. They called, called for equal advancement opportunities on the job. This is 1915. And they called for a place at the peacemaking table. It's in that spirit that we are gathered here today. And I want us to be as adamant and determined as those people were who got on those ships to travel across the world to participate in this conference that we are not going to go home without being changed and without making change. Say, say, say their names. Brown, as she calls for her mother. Say her names, black girls matter. Say their names, black women matter. Can you feel a feeling of fury? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not one more killing. Not here. Not there. Not in our homes, not in our streets, not at the end of our guns, not at the bottom, at beneath our bombs, not at the end of a fist, not from poverty, not from hunger, not from homelessness, not from being poisoned, not from being so desperate you just give up on life. What happened to your daughter? Uh, my daughter, Michelle Cousseau, was killed August the 14th, 2014, by the Phoenix Police Department. Uh, to get, go back a little further, Michelle's mental health problems started at the death of her brother. After that incident, Michelle's health started to deteriorate, her mental health. Mm. And throughout the years, it, uh, it regressed. She uh, would come and go and at this particular time I, the mental health providers felt as if she needed to come in and get stabilized on medication. So back to that day Michelle was killed, police went to Michelle's house with, no, with only uh, order of protection. That was to bring her in. Michelle had no warrants. She had not committed a crime. She had um, her. She was guilty of being at home, mm -hmm. and uh, and the police coming to uh, to do her pickup orders, and like I said in the interim, no one went down to get pepper spray. No one negotiated with her. None of these things happened, and like I'm saying, after six minutes <laughs> after the sergeant came out, she was dead. He uh, instrumented one officer to pry her door open and go into Michelle's home. He 
also went in, as he said, Michelle at that point had a hammer and he shot Michelle once in her heart. Mm. Um, she mm -hmm. was killed instantly. And uh, he said because he feared for his life mm -hmm. and the other six officers, mm -hmm. now it's six officers that had surrounded Michelle's home. The uh, first arriving officers knew the situation that they were going out to deal with a person who had a mental health problem. Uh, perhaps they had had training, but the uh, uh, officer, the sergeant who came out, he had no training. And as we found out later, as he appeared before his superiors, before the excessive use board, they found him guilty of 14 violations. When we're talking about the experiences of my people, the untouchables, although we do not use that term, we call ourselves Dalit, one who has been broken by struggle, but who is defined and refined by it. Um, we see ourselves as a people who have struggled against one of the largest systems of oppression in the world. And what's so profound about the caste system is that it's a system of both race, class, and faith that basically at birth determines the whole of your life. Because your caste tells you your level of spiritual purity. It tells you what profession your family might have. And also where you will be in the hierarchy. So if you're a Brahmin, you're a priest and you're at the top and you have access to full of society's structural resources. But if you're an untouchable, a Dalit, you're someone who's, com who's condemned and you live in separate places. You have separate places of worship. And this apartheid is held by a deep, deep abiding violence and a culture of atrocity which we never hear about. And what's remarkable to me, especially when we talk about violence against women in India, is that even after the horrific rape that happened in Delhi two and a half years ago, you still did not hear in the conversation about violence against women in India that some of the root causes of that violence lay with the caste system. And yet, you would never imagine talking about the experience of black women under slavery without mentioning slavery. So for us as Dalit women, we have to say that in order to achieve a gender just India, we must end caste apartheid. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this is not the national call, the fact that we <clears throat> haven't heard this has to do every much with the conversation and the solidarity that we have with the Say Your Name movement. Yanar? My thoughts? Your thoughts? Is there a name you want to say? Is there a yeah, snapshot I you want to share? I just arrived last night to New York and I was flipping over the television and my hotel only puts news television. And it's all about how these radicalized Islamists worked in California and killed people. And I was thinking, why is everybody so upset about this accident or this crime? Don't they know that when the US occupation of Iraq happened that the U.S. administration seeked every uh, extremist in the country, empowered him and his group, armed him, put him in the parliament, and made them a, gov a government on top of all Iraqis? Don't they know that the U.S. goes, the U.S. government, and I, I need to clarify here, American people are lovely, but the government is not the same. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the criminal George Bush is still out there. He started a war on Iraq and he put every extremist in power. Every Islamist extremist was put in power and they marginalized half the country and they turned them into an opposition, put them in prisons and tortured them for 10 years until mm. people like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi became a reality. They have been killing us, bombing us, and this is an act of division on the Iraqi people that was such a cruel political intervention. Just, we just do not de deserve this. Just explain for people a little bit more. <laughs> just elaborate a little bit more on what you just said and give us the picture of what an alternative might have been, an alternative approach. 
uh, Iraq is known to be in the in the region in the Middle East. It's known to be the country where you have the highest numbers rate of university graduates, where you have the biggest progressive leftist uh, political party organized a membership in the society. It's known to have all the political parties from nationalists to the center, to the left, everybody. But the, the American occupation and the administration did not want those. Mm -hmm. They only wanted the right wing who are the Islamists and the tribals to come to power. So now between the, under the Iraqi government and under ISIS, women are being trafficked. They are being, they are second, not even secondary, 10th rate citizens. <coughs> women under ISIS are being burnt alive on the streets. <coughs> women under ISIS are being enslaved. And once their city gets liberated, their tribe comes back and they kill them under honor killing. So this is so cruel. And when I think of the other minorities in Iraq, just like our black sisters in Iraq, we had to create a shelter specifically for our black sisters. And they are not given any opportunities of education, of work, no respect. This is the democracy that was created in Iraq. So once uh, such a bad place is created, how can anybody complain about it leaking into other parts of the world? Of course it does with the, the technology, with the high technology and travel and everything. This is such a, it's not such a cruel world, but US imperialism is such a cruel reality over the rest of the world. I would say. I would say not one more woman and not one more country. No country should go under what we witnessed in Iraq. No more wars. No more wars. No more wars. No more. Before when you were saying the American people are wonderful people and we're not responsible, we are responsible. We elect leaders, we determine people, and we're quiet or we're not quiet when our legislators say, for example, it's time to bomb Syria. We're quiet when our legislators say we can't let um, Syrian and Iraqi and other kinds of refugees into our country. I, I really feel right now if we don't begin an all-out anti-US imperialism war movement, we are going to see the escalation of terror in every direction of the world. And um, I just, I just want to say something to echo what Yanar was saying, because I read this article recently. Um, I'm obsessed with torture, probably because I felt tortured when I was a child, and I, I know what torture does to the mind and the heart and the soul. And I read this article about Camp Buka, which was one of the US prisons in um, Iraq. Camp Buka was a place where they held people who were not part of that government that Yanar was talking about. There was no reason they were really holding them because they hadn't really done anything, far as we could tell. Um, they tortured them with kind of tortures where they had scorpions crawling over their bodies, where they were sodomized, where they were humiliated in front of women and made to crawl. Do you know that 17 of the 25 people who are the leadership of ISIS were born in Camp Buka? Yeah. They met there. Yeah. They bonded there. They were determined to fight back against the US empire. Now, now, I don't know about all of you, but if someone sodomized me and put scorpions in my body and raped me regularly and made me crawl and gave me no direction, outcome, outlet, I can't tell you what I would do. But I know I would have anger. And I know I would be revengeful. And I think every time we see a terrorist action rather than responding to that action as if it happens in some goddamn vacuum. This country has to start looking at why and what compels people to fly planes through buildings. What compels people to blow themselves up? What compels people to lose their own souls in acts of violence? Because so much violence has been done to them or their families or their countries or their homelands that they have absolutely no outlets. And I just want to say, as a person who lives in this country, our efforts are not enough. We have not gone far enough. We are not radical enough. We are not charged enough. We are not committed enough to stopping these goddamn wars. And we all need to stand up and do more. 
one comment on that. I think that, you know, when it was uh, Vietnam, because the victims were brought back home, uh, the movement was strong. People were going out because they felt that maybe my son or my daughter is going to be next. Exactly. One part of this problem is that we are the ones who are dying all the time. We are the ones, you know, when I tell you in one week, 2,202 Gazans died. You know, if they have been dead in Paris or if they have been dead in New York, if they have been dead in Chicago, the whole world would change. And in Iraq, you know, one million people have been dying. And, you know, it's just like sometimes we accept the fact that we, do, we are not equal living, but we have accepted the fact that we are not equal dying. Yes. Thank you. I have no doubt that American people, as Eve said, irresponsible. They are not irresponsible. I have experienced they are the most kind people if they are aware. But unfortunately, the role of the media, the commercial media, is so negative. I don't say it's passive. It's very active, but negatively. It's very ill-informing, misinforming. The government's manipulating the media. Media is manipulating the public opinion. And they, they, they want to deviate us from the truth. How do we learn not to care? What's the first instance of um, someone um, not caring about the humanity of, of someone else? The first instance for, for most people here isn't the, the failure to recognize the humanity of someone across the world is the failure to recognize the humanity of someone who lives in the next block, mm -hmm. right? Um, the, someone who lives in the very next house. We learn not to care by the stories we accept about why certain people live in communities with no resources, why certain children go to sleep hungry in the wealthiest country in the world, why certain bodies can be killed on video and nobody cares about it. So our, our challenge is understanding that what we do to each other, we do in spades to people all around the world. What would be the difference if the woman on the other side of this headline wasn't a stranger, wasn't a blip, something that you would share at a water cooler and keep going, but was actually my mother or my sister. How would it change everything about the way I would change everything to bring justice? And I think that allowed me the courage to let go of all the things that were not essential except the struggle to achieve self-determination and justice for my community. And you know, I think one of the things that we have to really deeply acknowledge in this room about India is India is now the largest fundamentalist country in the world. Mm -hmm. Except that we don't talk about Hindu fundamentalism because we're so obsessed about the Muslim fundamentalism that we're using to justify US imperialism. <laughs> But we have other empires that are brewing. And when you look at India and we look at China, we see them as large imperialist forces that are now starting to take over the countries of, of Asia. And with the Hindu fundamentalism in India, you have the atrocities that have been honed on the bodies of Dalit women being used for other communities. Because women and gender nonconforming and trans people are always the canaries in the coal mine. So what we see with Dalit women, we see now with Muslim women, we see with Christian women. So much to the point that in last month alone, um, in this town of uh, Ghazibad, you had two men pull a Muslim woman out of her grave to rape her. At the behest of one of the leading parties, the BJP's, uh, leader who was encouraging people, we have to show these Muslims what they're about. We need to take their women and rape them even if they're dead. Because rape is always used as a tool in my country to be able to enforce the apartheid and control lines. So all of this violence is performative. You take Dalit women, you strip them naked in the, sh in, the, in the square, you shave their heads, you set them on fire, you hang them from trees, because our bodies are the message in which caste is spread across. And so when we think about as a world, when we talk about the world that we want to build in, when we are part of a country whose companies are willingly doing business with a country like India, when we have Obama saying he thinks that the Prime Minister, and keep in mind, Prime Minister Narendra Modi oversaw the, the pogroms of over 2,000 Muslims killed when he was the governor of Gujarat, saying, 
I feel like he has a clear-headed vision for the country. I trust him. We have Mark Zuckerberg saying, Prime Minister Modi, he knows what to do to take our country out of poverty. And so for me, I feel like when I hear fundamentalism, I don't actually hear fundamentalism. I hear smokescreen for capital. You know, I have always done this exercise. How come my name is Saad? Is it I who chose my name? No. How come that I am Palestinian? Is it I who chose my nationality? No. How come I am a woman? I did not make a choice of my gender. I did not make a choice of my nationality. I did not make choice of my religion. So it is, I always find it so amazing that we all become very strong about these things. You know, <laughs> I am a Palestinian and Palestine is the best na nation. I just find it so amazing that we all, we, you know, it's all given to us and then we defend it. And that gave me a, really an exercise, and I do it my, with my students at Buzid. I say, can you imagine yourself a Jew? And they look at me, it's like Jewish. No, I can't. Why? Why Jewish out of all religion? Can you imagine yourself? I mean, we have to really give that simple practice of can you imagine yourself something else? Uh, I think that's one of the problems of humanity, that we are all sitting thinking that my religion is the best religion and my nationality is the best. And we free ourselves. As you said, women are the you know, daughters of this globe. And I feel that we have to have human or universal values, full stop. I get so mad when the Israelis say or the Jewish community says, but this is not the Jewish values. What are the Jewish values? This is not Arab values. What are the Arab values? I think there is only one value, which is universal value that we as a human being are equal, full stop. Yeah. Thank you. You said value, and I can't help it. I want to go back to economics um, yeah. resources. Right. And talk a little bit about the economic roots of the situation of, of, of white supremacy in America. Because when you talked, or when we talked earlier today about false narratives, the narrative that we have around African Americans in this country could not be more false in terms of their relationship to the assets of this nation. Mm -hmm. Black Americans are presented as a problem. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have had an industrial revolution if not for enslaved African workers. We would not have built capitalism as we have built it, as it is attempting to take over the world without enslaved African workers. You are at the root of the creation of American capitalism, which I suggest is very specific kind of capitalism. As you say her name, <laughs> How do you understand those connections? How do you talk about those connections? Mm -hmm. I wonder if in saying her name and unraveling that, we could get to the root of the power problem on this planet. Right, right. So, you know, when, when, when I teach my civil rights course, one of the things that I start with um, is the contradiction between the story that we like to tell ourselves and the story about how this country actually got started. So we like to tell ourselves that we were born in a revolutionary moment built around the idea of democracy and freedom. Um, that, that's a story that you know, a lot of people are sticking with. Um, it's, it's a story that gets projected across the world and it's one of the reasons people get so shocked when we tell them, well, okay, now let's talk about the real story. The real story is the conditions of possibility for this country uh, were built on slavery, geno genocide, and colonialism, right? Um, the importation of masses of Africans, the genocide of Native Americans, and the land grab against those who lived across the border, and now the border has crossed them. Um, so the consequence of this basic story is that when we talk about structural inequality, when we talk about institutionalized racism, institutionalized inequality, we're talking about how the generations of this moment of foundation continue to build on each other. We project that across the world now. So it's not that we have problems, we have problem people. And the way we, the way we deal with problem people is we punish them. We, we, we wrap them up into prisons or we bomb them. 
We deprive them of education or we deprive them of their ability to use their natural resources, not for self-defense, but for the ability to improve the lives of everybody in, in the regions of the world. The majority of women who have been killed by the police department has had uh, mental health issues. And the majority of the women that they were killed with these behavioral health issues were killed in their home, mm -hmm. the same as my daughter. So uh, there is similarity there and throughout. Mm -hmm. So um, what is it that we do? How do I fight this fight? It's our legacies of patriarchy, of class privilege, of racism, of xenophobia, of colonialism. These are the things that we need to wrap our heads around. We need to be able to identify them. We need to be able to hold the politicians that we support accountable for their own failures. Well, that was part two of a two-part special, Bodies of Revolution, recorded last year in New York. You can see part one at our website. That's lauraflanders.com. And if you haven't signed up yet to support programming like this that comes to you free of advertising and free of government sponsorship, please sign up, support this program, and thanks. <laughs>